All right, uh, thanks very much for having me here um, today to speak about the topic that I'm um, mostly fascinated about as a researcher. And I've been re fascinated with this topic for almost 15 years now. Um, and it's time to challenge us in those acquisitions. Um, so my fascination is very profound and I'm almost like preaching a message here uh, about, uh, about the importance and, and how to deal with this. Sometimes that message can be a little bit hard to get through uh, simply because it's like selling an insurance a bit because you don't really know that you need to know these things until you acquire an organization. And part of my key message is at that time, it's too late. Uh, these are the things that should have done in two years. A lot of these things you should have done two years before you even knew they were going to acquire the company. And that sort of contributes to the challenges that I'm going to speak about. Now. But I will start off with telling a little bit who I am and why I am interested in this. Um, so I'm uh, Stefan Henningsson, a uh, professor at uh, Copenhagen Business School at the Department of Digitalization, um, where I'm in studying of studying and uh, researching since uh, 10 years. Um, before that, I did a PhD in, in Sweden at uh, Lund University on this very topic of IT challenges in merchant acquisitions. Um, I'm, uh, I'm engaging uh, in teaching this in executive levels and uh, for master students and, and also working with companies uh, most recently uh, with Maersk, um, who uh, founded our uh, industrial PhD, uh, Peter Wynn who just recently submitted his thesis. Um, after working three years um, on site with Maersk, helping them to, to tackle this issue. Um, and he's now employed um, in, in this capacity. But he also worked with, um, with Cisco systems, uh, with Siemens, um, Danisco here in Denmark, and, uh, and studying Danske Bank, Nordea, and, and, and a lot of large multinationals doing this. As well as, as a, a couple of smaller organizations um, either I mean, in the tech stats, startups uh, trying to get a way through or, or, or otherwise just using the acquisition or, or the merger as, as a strategic tool to do business. Yeah. But I will start off with telling why I, how I became fascinated with this and this story actually starts I think in 2004 in September, a Tuesday afternoon, somewhere around like quarter past two. Uh, when I, I mean, this is uh, about a week into my PhD, I got funded by a company called Trello Board that do like rubber components. Uh, if you look behind your fridge, you see a small black rubber hose, and that's most likely done by Trello Board. Um, so they have about 20,000 pe people uh, doing this kind of stuff. And because they funded my PhD, uh, one of the first thing I, I, I did was to meet with the CIO and asking him, maybe with a slightly different um, uh, phrasing, but what's your problem? And I was basically saying that, okay, so if you get four years to dwell into something, what would you look at the trailer boy that matters for the company the most? And he just looked at me and then he became silent. I mean, getting a CIO to become silent for a while, it, it's quite an achievement. So he, well, one minute he didn't say much, but then he looked at me and said, IT integration. And I was like, why? Well, I have two examples. So one company that we acquired 10 years ago, and we just recently um, considered that project to be done. It took us 10 years to do the IT integration of that company. Then we have another company that we acquired six months ago. Two months we were done with that integration. And I couldn't tell when we do an, another acquisition, will it be a 10 year or three month project? Um, before, when we are doing the due diligence and negotiating, we don't really know if this is going to be a 10 year or three month issue. Um, and if I had four, four years to think about something, I would probably start there. Um, all right. So I'm very, very happy with this. Um, I never heard about acquisitions, never heard about mergers, but here was something that of, of significant importance. And, um, and particularly reading up a little bit more about what, what these challenges were, I realized how fundamentally important it became. To, to many companies. So starting out, this, so this, is a, is, this is a quote from one of the um, uh, heads of IT integration I, I'm spoken with. Um, and he admittedly decided that when they were about to do an acquisition, saying that, okay, so our CEO has done everything job, 
everything right in this role since it came to the company. Um, we've been I mean, restoring profitability. Uh, we are one of the um, leading companies in the sectors, but now we're gonna do an acquisition. And if he gets that one wrong, he will still lose his job um, because he will lose so much of the shareholder value and, and the money of the company. And I say, well, if IT is the cause that this acquisition fails to create value, I mean, the CIO also loses his job. So that's what we're up to. I mean, we're playing here a game where the, the, the impact is make or break in carriers. Um, and, uh, and, and the number of zeros behind the value that is potentially created or destroyed is of huge importance. Um, so I mean, looking into this, um, in the world, we have around 40,000 deals per year. Um, the number is steadily increasing. Um, uh, it's become, it just become a standard way of practice of enacting business strategies to grow, to, uh, to go into new markets, to, to stay innovative um, for all types of different business reasons. But basically four different reasons. I mean, either way you're gonna go growth by scale to become bigger. Uh, to go by scope, by having new products adding to your offering, or uh, go for innovation improvements like the um, uh, the car industry is now. I mean, has we seen a record number of I think an increase of three hundred percent in the car industry's acquisition of tech companies mm. uh, just to survive the shift to digitalization, and then we see complete transformations. Someone is realizing like, hey, my business is going away. Uh, I need to do something about it. It could be a niche business that doesn't work and want to go for scale, or it could be a scale business that want to go for niche, or I mean, someone going into a new market. But what we know about this is that almost two thirds are considered financial failures if you look at it from that current perspective. So two out of three of these things. And we said, well, going back, failure means when I mean, career is over. Mm. So it's, it's quite a significant number. And we know, of course, it matters on how we measure it, but, and some say that 80%, some say it's 50%, but I mean, it's a, it's a significant number. Now, what I learned through my studies um, is that I do play a role in this, right? So going back to the some four, that role was a little bit less. And going back even I mean, 10 years before that to I mean, 95 or even 80s, IT was not a really a big part of this. But I mean, the more we use IT, the bigger the role of IT becomes. But IT is still only right, actively involved in about maybe a fifth, maybe a quarter, maybe a third now of the cases when you actually look at acquiring a company. Only in a quarter of the cases that we consider, okay, so what are we gonna do with IT and what are we gonna uh, experience in terms of challenges here? Now, considering the fact that some integration might take 10 years and some take three months, you might think that that is a, um, insufficient number. Um, but we also know that I mean, a, a large part of the cost for actually building companies together uh, is directly IT. So I, I, I asked the question to a bank about, okay, so how much of your integration cost is IT? And, the, and the, I mean, the general acquisition manager looked at me and said, what do you mean? How, I mean, how much is IT? Everything. I mean, there's nothing but IT in the, in the bank integration. So, and that might be I mean, a figure uh, for a large bank merger I, I saw was um, two billion Danish kroner uh, for the integration program, um, which would be, why is it? Uh, three, 300,000 euro, 400,000 euro. Um, in that, that's the range, right? Now we might go up to, uh, to uh, double that today uh, with the increasing speed of use of it. We also know that when you ask managers about it, they say that IT integration is the third most frequent reason for failure. Actually, I saw a new survey saying that was the second most uh, frequent reason for failure. Um, and only what one third deemed that they succeeded in the last IT integration. So that's sort of the, the, the setup. To really understand, okay, so how IT integration is, is implicating acquisition, um, we need to understand also about um, when and how does IT constrain um, the, the, the reason for why you're doing this business. And now I believe we have a poll question for the audience. Yeah. Um, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's go there. So 
Yeah, I will launch the first poll. And I can also read the question. So how much expected business benefits are dependent on IT integration? And you have four options and uh, we know the answer. Yes. But let's see uh, what you think. So all yeah, all of you. Uh, yeah, I'll share the results. Great. And just one second here. I can see that. Okay, cool. Yeah. So this is the result. Yes. So it seems like we're speaking with an experienced audience here. Yeah. So the, um, the result coming from uh, Mac Center and McKinsey Service says that it's about uh, between 45 to 60% of the like synergies, uh, the cost savings, the revenue growth that you're expecting from this is directly dependent on IT integration. Uh, the 45 would be in like uh, some manufacturing industry, maybe construction, and the 60 would be in, in finance. Now you might ask, okay, so what are the other 40%? Well, it's something with, uh, um, with lower processing prices per unit by, by legal consolidation and, and, and I mean, ability to get the loans to a, a lesser interest rate and so on. So that's, that's the, the setup. And how, and how this is showing up really? Okay, so a specific case. Um, speaking about Maersk, as we will speak a little bit more about Maersk today. Yeah. Um, this is a, a 10 year old story uh, um, and, and a painful experience that we basically took the, the company 10 years to recover from uh, in terms of being willing to acquire again. So Maersk did a stream of acquisitions and, and, and it went pretty good, um, particularly with the one of Sealand um, a year before this um, that, that was very successful in expanded business. And now they're acquiring P&O and Nedloyd, um, which were known to have a strong IT infrastructure, um, strong to, I mean, strong application software, I mean, very modern. But the issue here was that the p and infrastructure could not scale to the combined volume. They could handle p and node alone, but not the combined company. Uh, and Maersk, on the other hand, they had IT set up in, in silo mode, uh, not the global processes that p and for example, had. So Maersk really wanted to get, move away from that sort of silo country-based IT infrastructure. And uh, now, they, because they couldn't use any of them, they really had to move to a new platform. That, by the way, was being developed at the time. But um, that project went into, into issues. Uh, it was delayed. Uh, they went live too early. And I mean, 10 years later, is I mean, just as my explanation to what happened, uh, as there are people remembering this, this thing. But the fact is that, I mean, Financial Times had a big article about the, what they call the I mean, disastrous uh, acquisitions uh, botched by IT integration. Um, and single out IT as the real issue why this all happened. And it was true for four months because of this IT mess, they could not uh, send invoices. I mean, four months not sending invoices. I mean, I spoke with the, some of the customers that were desperately calling them for tax reasons, saying that we're going to send you money anyway. We're going to send you just as much money we sent last year just to get this uh, into our books. Um, and they lost track of the ships. They didn't know where the ships were in the world. Um, and eight months they lost. I mean, market share, the global market share of shipping, uh, container shipping from 18 to 14%, 25% of the customers went because of IT integration. So this is, this, this is how, how bad it can become. And, and this is why you should care about this way before you end up having a situation where you, I mean, oh, you can't use this, you can't use this, whoa, 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 what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. Right, um, we need to move on. So, right, so, <clears throat> On the other hand, there are a very positive example, and this goes across industries. So Cisco, for example, is very like innovation, do um, innovation acquisitions. And they managed to do that on average with one month uh, integration time. Uh, Semex, which is like a concrete manufacturer from, from Mexico, is rolling out over the world by just buying up small concrete and implementing standard processes like um, conveyed by IT. We have Danisco, a Danish example, known for being a disastrous acquirer that picked up the game. And in a, a very famous Danish case, just waited outside for the legal approval in hardware filled containers 
And on a Friday afternoon, went in to do a, like extreme IT makeover. And on Monday morning, the company were up and running. Um, and the trailer board case where I, where I, where I work for as a PhD student, they do maybe five, now it's, it's increased in pace. So maybe 10 acquisitions a year. Um, and then enable a complete business transformation from an old industrial company to a like modern solutions provider. And they continue to do 10 acquisitions a year just as part of their, their um, yeah, I mean, the way to do continuously evolve business. Yeah. Now, so, so how can these positive examples be contrasted with the very negative examples of, of Maersk and Zealand? And why does it, this make so, what are, they, what are the differences? What are they doing wrong? What are they doing right? And, and is it just luck or, I mean, how do we play this game? Now, so this presentation to deal with IT challenges, um, I'm gonna to touch upon three different areas. Um, I mean, the methods and the outcomes to deliver, um, the skills needed to enact them, and, and, and really what we've been doing in the last, I mean, three years together with MASK is really around preparation. Yeah. Um, because MASK decided to start preparing for the acquisition just when they heard through the grapevine that they were considering buying someone. And for two years, they built this capacity until it was announced that they actually found a target. Um, uh, and, and it wasn't, at that time, it wasn't sure that they would actually buy anyone, but they still had to, to start preparing because that was such a small cost to be able to play later on. Now, a lot of this is, uh, I mean, we put a reference there where we did a, um, I mean, expand the literature review in one of the I mean, uh, most influential um, academic journals. So the ones really considering this are really, uh, um, interesting topic, we'll read this very dry uh, work, admittedly, that it's almost like a, a reading a dictionary because it lists all the references and whatever else. Uh, there's not really no story to it, but it's, it's, a, it's a reference material for one's interest. Yeah. All right, so, and what I will tell about is, is eventually this model uh, about how things fit together uh, from the preparation to the performance and outcomes. So this is where we're gonna end. Now, methods and outcomes. Um, if we speak about outcomes, um, and this is from our review, um, we found 38 different ways to measure the outcome of an IT integration project. So when we say challenges, okay, so if there is a challenge, um, we need to understand, okay, so how do we get, I mean, what do we get out of it? And I mean, this is a very, um, I mean, long list, uh, and, and it shows that there are many ways to understand um, good or bad in this world. Uh, that's part of the complexity. But if we, um, group them together a bit, we can actually see that they exist at least on, on four different levels. So one is basically the IT project where we have time and time and cost. One is the merger acquisition project where we actually look at how much of the, um, how much of the uh, uh, synergies or the cost or the revenues are we able to create with IT? Are we being a, like a pain? Are we destroying the, the deal? The, the, the Third thing that people looked at in this context, uh, which I think is slightly interesting, is what it makes to IT to be part of an acquisition. So does it like, in, improve the credibility of the IT department, or does it destroy the IT staff's morale if things go bad? Um, do we inhabit future innovations and, and so on? And so it's basically, I mean, how, what, what is the effect on IT capability? And you might argue that, I mean, time and budget might be pretty relevant in the in comparison to if we're destroying our innovation capability um, cisco is a company that really 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 pay a lot of attention to this and um, really have a firm focus on, on the sort of depth that it's created uh, because they i mean if they lose on innovation if they make their company inflexible by acquiring they're they're out i mean they need to stay flexible and then the, 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 the fourth one is really what matters, right? It's, it's, the, it's the end of the um, balance sheet. It's the profitability. It's the long-term revenues, um, sustainability growth, or, and all these ways we can conceive that, including shareholder value. Now, <clears throat> so what I say, well, this is a bit complex, but this is, I mean, in the grand, grand schema, I mean, time, cost are reasonably irrelevant. They work as proxies. Um, time is important because it reduces our um, uh, return on the investment. Um, and if we push the deadline, um, the, the effects of, uh, of, of when we reap synergies are, are delayed and so on. So, but what we really, really care is about, okay, so how do we create the values we are created, I mean, expecting in the acquisition? So an M&A benefits 
directly links to uh, organization performance. If we can improve our I mean, economies of scale in this game, we, we get higher profit. The other thing that we might care about um, is what it makes the right capability. And there is a, a, a quite well-documented uh, literature saying that, um, I mean, these acquisitions do impact IT capability. Um, there's a significant outcome. But we also should remember here that this effect, if you do one acquisition, is actually quite small. So you might, I mean, I mean you might make yourself slightly more inflexible by acquiring company. But normally, I mean, unless it's it's a I mean, completely multi-mega deal with the two great company, companies going together, of which I think there was a 100 last year, so it's a, it's a, it's a rare case. Uh, then by acquiring a small company and, and integrating it in, in a, makes, I mean, 1% more inflexible. It doesn't really matter in the end. Where it matters if you're doing this over time. I mean, I spoke about Trello Boy doing this 10 times a year. Uh, for them, of course, this is a, a crucial thing because if you get 1% worse every time you do it and you do 10, 10, I mean, 10 a year, I mean, then this effect really matters. Right? So, so, but these are, these are really the, the areas where we need to, to understand where we are uh, implicating. Now, then methods, how do we do this? Well, there are actually four different methods, uh, four fundamentally different ways to achieve the scale, scope, improvement, transformation benefits we want to. And there is the absorption, coexistence, best of breed, and renewal. And let, let's have a little bit closer look on what it actually means. So the absorption means, I mean, it's a generic strategy that if you acquire, I mean, it could also be two merging companies, that you basically get rid of what one of them had and move both compensations to the I mean, first organizations I mean, IT infrastructure, IT platform, IT landscape. Uh, it's also known as rip and replace. So uh, if I would acquire a company, um, I say, okay, so yeah, leave your IT. I mean, your IT department is gone, now you're using ours. The uh, coexistence is quite the opposite, at least in a full scale, saying, okay, we have two companies, A and B, and uh, afterwards, I mean, they're still using the, the same IT platform and the same application as they're useful. If you want any synergy coordination, you really have to do that with like peer-to-peer -peer, uh, connections, uh, bridges between the systems, synchronization, which might be very hard if, if you want to do a um, um, operations um, um, scheduling. We want to have economies of growth, uh, economies of, and so. Um, the best of breed version is where you have I mean, A and B and you're handpicked, uh, try to determine, determine what is the best system, what is the best component for our supply chain, for example, between A and B. And if B has a better supply chain, we use that one. Is if A has a better product development capability and product development system, um, we use that one. And you'd really try to sort of handpick. And renewal, I mean, that was the... the um, the Maersk and the PNN Nedloyd, where you say, we can't use what Maersk had, we can't use what Nedloyd had. So let's do a new, completely new I mean, setup here. Now, and here I believe we also have a, a poll question yes. to our experienced and knowledgeable audience. So yes. I'm assuming they get everything right. So that's my opportunity to shine. And uh, I've launched the poll. So which of the four IT integration methods is most difficult to pull off? <laughs> yeah. Oh, so the pull I'm is actually only... missing one. I'm sorry. That's uh, my fault. Uh, but it's one of the three. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you get a little bit help here. <laughs> okay. Almost everybody has given their vote. I'm going to close the poll and launch it. Share the results. So here you see it. So 33% uh, mm -hmm. say coexistence and 67% say renewal. And it, I mean, it, it, it's basically, um, I mean, the, the, of course, this man, I mean, uh, contextually dependent, but on all aver average, creating a completely new thing is the most difficult. 
um, because you are, I mean, uncertain what you're moving to. I mean, imagine how many ERP implementations that go wrong in the first place. And now you put in the, the factor that you don't really know what, what you want to move to. I mean, and the political negotiation, who's going to decide what we're moving to. Uh, are we going to have in the logic that organization, that organization? So they're adding a, I mean, a new organizational uh, dimension to it. And I mean, and doing this complete renewal. Um, I'm doubtful that I've ever seen someone actually pulling this off in a, in a, in a good way. Um, in a decent way, yes, but, but not like according to the plans and, 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 uh, and not without frictions. Um, so don't do re renewal, at least not the full scale. Well, you might be doing a renewal. I mean, Trello Boy, for example, quite often do it when they acquire a small organization, okay. combine it with, with specific business unit to um, reposition that business unit. And when they did it in, um, when they uh, had a small niche player in, in, uh, in manufacturing industrial halls, and then they got acquired two more companies doing the same, and they repositioned them as a, a scale player, being the cost leader in the, in the market. And for that, they needed a new IT infrastructure, United platform, and that they pulled off after eight years. But so, is, is that common when you have a bigger? organization acquiring a small one. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the innovation. Uh, yeah. Way of doing it. So it's it's common. I mean, not, I mean, it's certainly common that you mean, uh, I mean, Cisco, for example, would do a lot of um, uh, when I, I mean, acquire uh, the business unit that's a little bit more mature. They might do something with specific technology innovation that only gets like the patent and, and four people who do I mean, know about it. Okay. But uh, when they acquire Tandbag, for example, they, um, the sort of uh, IP uh, uh, telecommunications provider um, that you can use for video conferencing, that came with a completely new business model, a completely new way of of of, of do, I mean providing uh, um, um, communication platform for for companies. But Trump, by on the other side, I mean the reason why they were acquired because they were working and 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 successful in in, in ways outcompeting Cisco. Uh, so they wouldn't have the issue of replacing their IT platform because what they got was a completely working company. Um, so this might, I mean, this must be the rare case where where you have is not working, and what you acquire is not working. But together, you you think that you can play around and make them work. But it's so uncertain that I mean, you rather rarely see it in practice that you do. So, I mean you have something that doesn't work and combine it with something that doesn't work and try to make it something brilliant. Um, it's, easy, it's easier to start with something that works. Either, either you have it or they have it. Okay, yeah. Right. Cool. So. That works. Okay. <laughs> so the first lesson to learn here um, is that when we speak about integration, um, I mean, if this were the Olympics, I mean, it would refer to a set of very different sports. I mean, there could be a pool vault and, and marathon, or I mean, it could be uh, swimming, or I mean, and, and even golf nowadays in some Olympics. So, uh, and so when we, this is a very heterogeneous construct. Um, it's a very different thing. I mean, uh, that that we are we group in this in this sort of challenge, um, and that that's a really, actually quite important lesson to learn. Because when we speak about skills, um, we can have two I mean, high level tasks that looks very similar. So diagnosis is one where you actually determine what mix of integration methods you need to apply here, understanding the business value uh, and the business, the way they enable business to set up the, the, the mix. Uh, and that includes I mean, secure IT resources, for example, if you're acquiring a business unit from a competitor, um, what are they shipping with that unit? Um, and sometimes the legal contracts don't don't specify it. Sometimes they say we don't shipping anything. Then you're sitting there without like a foundation for your business. Now, but if you think of implementation, we can position the different strat I mean methods uh, in terms of organizational complexity and technical complexity. Um, renewal being, in my my experience, the most complex. I mean, it requires about the technical complexity of I mean, configuring, installing completely new. I mean, ERP platform and so on, but also organizational complexity because you're doing this under the 
like influence of, of negotiation, political conflicts, and, and so on, and control for the company. Um, coexistence, I mean, if you just leave them alone, I mean, it's pretty simple, but you don't get much benefit. So where it's starting to become I mean, technical complex, at least, is when you try to make them work in a synergistic way, and then it moves towards the technical complexity. But if you just leave them there, when I mean, it's easy, it's just that it doesn't create any value. Now, but when we think about this, and this is, uh, this is from, um, from the Maersk case, and uh, this is the work by Peter Wynn, who, who worked there for three years, uh, trying to figure out, okay, so what resources needed Maersk to de develop in order to pull off the integration of Hamburg Sud? And there were, I mean, a whole bunch of sets, uh, including like building relationship to new um, business organizations like HR, uh, so that on the day they acquired, they could walk over to HR and I mean, they would understand what were the requirements of IT in, in, in bringing the workforces together. Um, they would walk over to uh, um, the um, production departments where they mean contain a con track of the containers and so on. But it also means that, I mean, they had to create a, like a, a playbook, uh, a, a generic mes a method about the checkpoints. Um, and, and the phases that they will roll out so they don't have to invent this at the time that the sort of light, lightning strikes in their world. Um, and they had to start fixing physical things like, um, can our system scale? Because I mean, if you realize that your, I mean, your IT setup cannot scale to handle the volumes of, of an acquired company, I mean, yes, I mean, it gets easier with the, with the cloud services, but it still takes the time to sort of I mean, expand. Um, can we add, products of that kind. I mean, I know companies that run into issues with saying, yeah, we do. Um, I mean, SAP spoke about uh, doing uh, um, pricing per consumption, but is it consumption per user? Is it consumption per, per hour used it? Or is it I mean, consumption per license or consumption by country? And, and it turned out that I mean, some of the companies they were quite had very different views on consumption. When can it exist with this sort of customers? Do we protect them in that way? Can we have this working in, in, the, in the German market? I mean, does it support uh, um, in Chinese language if we're gonna acquire a Chinese company and do an absorption? So all those things that you're in would take years and years and years to implement if it wasn't in place. And then the humans, okay, so how do we, I mean, who, who do we need to have in the team? What did competences do they need to have? Um, and, and when explaining, dependencies to unite our roadshow and so on. So a lot of I mean, resources that need to be developed along the way. And uh, <clears throat> even though these are very high I mean, general constructs, diagnose implementation, when we combine this with thinking about what they are required to do in absorption and the rip and replace strategy compared to a best of breed uh, or a renewal for that, that sake, um, what is it's very different resource that enables this and there, I mean, implementation means fundamentally different things. Uh, if it's an absorption or if it's renewable, you don't need the same competences in house. Um, your I mean, demands of your IT infrastructure or platform are fundamentally different if you want to do an absorption or a coexistence. If you want to do an absorption, it's all about, okay, can they scale? Can they, I mean, they, um, can they handle the volume existence? How easy is it to connect? I mean, do, do it, I mean, work with standardized interfaces uh, between the companies and so on. So it's, it's uh, the different demands on, on your physical assets. It's different demands on your, I mean, your human working in the company. And it's very different demands on the enabling structures, you mean, uh, your communication channels, your, I mean, your trust, uh, depending on which way you're gonna go with the, with the, with the methods. Now, so, I mean, logically, I mean, speaking about the Olympics again, it requires quite some different skills to compete in uh, swimming than pool vault versus golf, logically. Um, so when we speak about a company being a, a good at IT integration, it's very, very rarely that we speak about a company that is good in all forms of IT integration. I mean, Semex that we mentioned as one of the good ones really had a, a, a skill set set up to do the uh, absorption one by one by one. 
Um, they, I mean, that was really good. Cisco, on the other hand, is, is really good on the sort of the um, improvements to take something that is good in the, in the company that they acquired and preserve that unique cap capability. Um, Cisco, by the way, is, is quite good in all, all regards, um, but the, I mean, that does require some very sophisticated capabilities. We could see that uh, um, um, companies like Danisco, I mean, starting up being very good at absorption, then learning to become good at coexistence, uh, partial coexistence, um, but, uh, um, but never really trying the renewal. And I would doubt that even you, with skill sets, you will find someone that's consistently good at renewal um, uh, because those are so unique challenges. Yeah. But anyway, lesson two, different sports require different sk skill sets to compete. That's, that's a crucial part of understanding IT challenges. Now, and then, so now, I mean, I've been working on this for almost 15 years. Um, and I feel like I'm, I mean, as old as my three-year-old daughter here, is I asking, why is this? Why is this? Why is this? Why that? Uh, and uh, so what we're working on, on the last couple of years is, OK, so we're now, OK, so going back to the issue of the Trello board, I mean, why did it take 10 years or three months? Well, because there were fundamentally different challenges. I mean, one being an easy absorption, one being a renewal. Okay, so why, what does it take to pull this off? Well, I mean, a whole different set of things. Okay, so why are some companies still um, able to, to mount these resources while others are not? So we're going I mean, recursively backwards in, in explanation, and then we're gonna end up with, I mean, what's the meaning of life eventually? But anyway, here, here we go. So the first thing is that, well, reflection is really good to build capabilities. And that is, uh, um, that's a fact from a consequence of how complex acquisitions are. You actually don't learn anything by just doing them and, and not thinking about what you've done. If, to, be, to be true, the research shows that um, you actually become dumber by doing one acquisition. So the average performance of the, like the company doing the second and the third acquisition is is less than a novice acquiring doing its first. Um, and they say that, well, this is a, I mean, the hypothesis is, I mean, this is an empirical fact that I mean, the second and the third creates less value than the first. Uh, and then there is some sort of a U shape. So by the time you get to your 10th or 11th, you're actually creating more than the, than the novice. Uh, but the first you, you, you get worse. And, and some say call this superstitious learning. So yet you, well, it worked with absorption. So next time you try with absorption as well. Um, or we thought we knew this, so we don't really pay so much attention to it. And the next time you, you, you screw it up because you, don't, you think you can do a, a best of breed, but hey, there was a very different settings. I mean, the people who were, were including in this deal were not collaborating, they were contesting acquisitions, they were fighting for their lives. Um, and there are no, I mean, no, no reasons to, to, to do it. What we were then doing is, um, uh, I think, okay, so why does it make sense to sense? Well, Make, make sense to reflect well because we don't it's so hard to determine what was the outcome we got this 38 different variables so we really have to okay so was this good or bad or i mean how was the outcome and then we have cautious ambiguity and say okay so if we consider this being a good or bad it's very hard even to tell why was it so you really have to have a formal evaluation method to go back and, and create i mean evaluations and yes you're never going to use those evaluations again Right. There is a name in company Siemens had a knowledge management system where they had uh, uh, listed all the problems they had and how to solve it. And I think at some point there were up to 2000 different problems in that database, uh, things that had gone wrong. And of course, they're not gonna look at those 2000, oh, are we doing the same again? But just by doing this, you, you're building it. Your, your people get smarter and you're starting to get a greater understanding of what are the main risks. And that's why the NISCA said, we will never ever use externals for our thinking here. We might have people I mean, saying things to us, uh, but if we use consultants in the NISC, we're actually always gonna use them as doing our ordinary stuff. And then our own people get to do the acquisition to learn so they don't walk. Now, the NISC was a company that set out, we're gonna do 20, 30, 40 of this. So they need to build this capability. It, it didn't matter if they got the first one slightly worse than uh, they could have done with the help of consultant. Like if you can only do one, or if you could do something that is outside your, you mean, comfort zone, 
I mean, there's certainly a ground for calling in consultants to help you establish this, getting, okay, inform me what are the decisions you need to make. But really, you have to really understand the company to make those calls on, okay, so how is a um, coexisting actually implicating our ability to innovate? Are we likely to have a shipping industry in the most case that are going to compete on digital innovation? Then coexistence might implicate it. If we, if we think we're going to do five more acquisitions, if we're going to do two, it's not that bad. But if we think it's the chances that we're going to fight and the industry goes in. So there is a very, very soft and very subjective things that you really need to know the essence of the company. Learning, um, one of the critical aspects. And now we can see that the, the, there's also a, like an arrow from AT capability saying that, okay, so here it matters. Uh, for the reflection and long term. If you mess up your IT capability, you're going to have difficulties in doing the next one. Um, because your structures, I mean, maybe your I mean, IT infrastructure get more and more flexible in every acquisition. And then it's going to feed back into the process. And then the, so lesson number three, you build, you don't buy the skills. That, that's um, that's no common for all the skills for acquire. And it makes sense to make sense, to reflect and learn. Otherwise, you have very limited learnings out of one acquisition. And then speaking about preparation, the last thing here. I mean, this is a, a, a quote from one of the conversations I had with, with people at Maersk. Say, well, it's actually not that in, difficult. Um, when you get there, the, the, yes, the catch is that you should have started doing it two years ago. By the time you know exactly what you need to do, it's typically too late to prepare. Uh, and because there is a push to, to create value, uh, the time is very short. So speaking out about Maersk here, um, they started this two years before they had identified a target. Um, they had like, like the capability that were going to extend, but they didn't know for what. So they were thinking about, okay, so what company are we going to acquire? Um, and what, how do we prepare for that? And they worked with like scoping of the challenge uh, I mean, focus on the things that they knew are going to matter regardless of, of what acquisitions we're doing, like communication lines to the different business partners. But also looking at, okay, so what if we do this acquisition? I mean, is there anything that we should have done, like scale, building a new IT infrastructure? Can it scale to 25%, for example? And because that we're going to take a year and then we're going to set us back. So it's a small price, price to pay. Now, now I believe we also have a poll question, the last one. Yeah. And it's a yeah, subjective one. But there are, in the Maersk, up to the Hamburg City acquisition, uh, they actually very fundamentally changed the view on what kind of companies they were likely to acquire, um, and also what kind of IT integration they were preparing for. And so now the question is, how many times did they change their mind? Yeah. I mean, as, as a, as a, as a just an example uh, of, of how this uncertainty is implicating the, the preparation process. And I can see everybody has hmm. given their vote. And it's, uh, ah. just, yeah. I'm glad you don't know everything. Uh, two times would be my answer. So. <laughs> maybe someone disagree with I me. Mean, maybe someone sitting from Maersk, no, 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 I know it was, it was full. But, uh, um, but we identified two, uh, two times. Um, and I would say, okay, so first thing, I mean, they didn't even speak about an acquisition, but we're still doing things that would make the acquisition better. Um, but here, I mean, on the foundation stage, they don't really know this. Then, I mean, they hear from the, from the newspapers, and I mean, people are saying that, oh, we, we're got, probably going to start to acquire something. Um, and they're forming an M&A team, building an M&A playbook. You're just thinking about, okay, in that stage, to think about a, a stream of small players coming available in the market saying that likelihood of we're going to buy large companies is non-existent. So we're probably going to do 10 small ones in order to build some momentum here. Um, then there comes uh, um, awareness um, that because of the fin I mean, financial crisis, because there is an issue in, or uh, well, not that financial crisis, but uh, uh, in, the, in the shipping industry, also large companies becomes available on the market. Um, large companies are suddenly up for sale. And, and they're thinking about, oh, let's, let's acquire a large one instead of just 10 smalls, because 10 smalls wouldn't I mean, it would take a long time to make a difference. Uh, let's acquire a large one. Um, but still thinking absorption here. 
because they think yeah, best of breed coexistence, those will be too complex in, in long run. Um, but then when, when they're starting to do the diligence of Hamburg City, they realize that Hamburg City is actually much better than Maersk in many regards. If this was like the uh, airline, there was one would be when the discount airline and one would be the premium airline. In some regards, Maersk is the discount and Hamburg City has much more happy customers than, than a premium product. Yeah. So by I mean, me integrating Hamburg City to Maersk uh, in an absorption way, they run the risk of eroding that sort of premium service and the, and the, and the uh, custom satisfaction. So then they changed their mind saying that we're not going to do absorption. We're going to do uh, softer gloves, the soft hands, soft touch, I think it's called, and, and try to give coexistence as much as possible. And they end up I mean, leaving all uh, this customer facing, all that would impact customer satisfaction. Because we don't really know why customers are so much, much happier with Hamburg Zoo than with Maersk. So we don't want to run the risk of restoring anything. So let's leave that part. Let's go for I mean, economies of scale in production, in container management, in, in the ships. And that's the second really uh, sort of um, tweak in the preparation. And now they know that oh, we're actually going to do coexistence. Coexistence was like, I mean, not existence in the beginning. Investor breed are not, no, it's too much complexity. Let's go for an absorption. Let's follow. We are the greatest. Yeah. And here they end up with a very different scenario. Um, so they build, I mean, preparing in a lot of areas. Um, I mean, this might be too small for you to read, but uh, I mean, there's a lessons learned. It's too much, a lot of preparation. And the, less, the core lesson here is that, I mean, set your up to deliver at day one. Um, because if you think about starting the integration journey on day one, it's too late. Um, by day one, I mean, your faith is pretty much determined. And so for Maersk, it was two years, two and a year and a half. Uh, and on day one, things were actually quite smooth. And integration was done in about six months uh, of this very um, uh, complex and uh, and uh, important acquisition of the company. So this is the final model here. Here we're ending yeah. with the preparations. I mean, we're not we're not starting with um, the meaning of life, but almost uh, what you do in a, in your IT infrastructure for general purpose, and you're ending on 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 impacting organizational performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this is a the value path from those preparation work. Summing things up. Now, to understand IT challenges in most acquisitions, we really need to understand that IT integration is a very heterogeneous thing. It, it, it refers to a lot of different things. And each of these require very different skill set to, to accomplish them. Yes, some things are similar. Um, and some things are actually similar to my general IT capabilities. But, but for each of the sort of methods, there's some things that are very, very unique and specific. And to, to get to the point where you actually deliver, um, you have to understand that, I mean, this is very tacit, requires a very contextually rich knowledge, requires very um, profound understanding of the systems and their capacity and how they were coded, what document, documentation exists. Coming out from the, in, from the outside or sourcing it, um, there are limitations. Yes, you can get very valuable advice, uh, but I mean, I would uh, advise against I mean, handing over the decision right. Uh, you, you basically need to solve this. You basically need to learn how to solve it. And it makes sense to make sense. You know, you mean you're learning by reflecting and you're preparing uh, yourself for a couple of years before your acquisition. But the issue there is that you have no clue what you're preparing for. Um, and that's the difficulty of the preparation challenge. Now, if you get this right, you'll be fine. Right. So thank you for dialing in and listening. Uh, and maybe we have a room for a, a, a few more questions. So, uh, so yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, write them or again, raise your hand and I'll give you the mic. At the moment, we don't have any, but I'll ask you a few questions. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> I was curious about uh, systems nature, if they are standardized or specialized. Could you put just uh, say a few words on how does that affect uh, an IT integration? Um, so in relation to the different yeah yeah so i mean if you need, mean the fact that okay so you mean you have an sap system and you know, do a sort of a vanilla version of it um i mean in the 
90s, I mean, 95, 96, and there was a lot of work done on, on that. And the, the lessons learned was that you should actually buy a company that has a system that is very similar to yourself. Okay. Um, I mean, I sort of disagree with that. I yeah. mean, it, it's the, the tail wagging the dog sort of thinking that, yeah. well, we can only buy companies with, with Oracle systems. Um, no executive management will ever buy into that sort of thinking. Um, and it doesn't really matter. Um, and I heard a lot of CEOs saying that it doesn't really matter. But on the other hand, it doesn't really matter if they have an SAP system and, and we have an SAP system because um, they're going to be contextualized, they're going to be modified, they're going to be configured. Um, and even if they're close to standardized, they're not standardized. You can never, you can never just bond them together. How, now, how this is going to play out in the cloud world remains to be seen. Right, so if they have Salesforce and we have Salesforce, would that actually mean that we just put a push a button and we have one unified Salesforce? Yeah. Well, there'd probably be configurations within. Right. Uh, but exactly, I mean, it, it's an exciting thing that makes me want to work a couple of more years at least with this topic <laughs> because we see, I mean, how the how these cloud transformations certainly going to solve some issues. We mean, scalability has been a major issue for absorptions because you don't want to have an IT infrastructure that I mean, had the capacity to handle twice your volume. But if you acquire someone, twi I mean, your size, you actually will do that. So, and that takes, a, I mean, imp implementing, I mean, a thousand more servers takes time. But now with, I mean, with cloud services, I mean, that, those technical issues are, are moving away. Um, so I think technically yeah. we're starting to see something that is similar, uh, simple, easier Same, to do, yeah. at least. Yeah. So we have a question here. Um, we actually have a, a couple. Well, I'll take the first one. If you buy a company with very distributed and heterogeneous infrastructure, what would be the best approach? Very distributed and heterogeneous infrastructure. Um, <laughs> uh, for the first thing to do is to lower expectations, if you can. <laughs> um, now, you mean, actually, I mean, Trello Boy employed this strategy quite often. And they said we had a mandate to do that um, and say, but it's much better to, to promise a realistic deadline mm -hmm. than to promise a deadline which you can't hold. Um, um, and what they were doing, so when they do this sort of like reposition of the, of, the, um, um, of the company, they were promising whatever they could do without actually touching IT to the market to have, okay, so these are the synergies we will recreate. And then, uh, and then it will take the time to get it right. No self-imposed deadline. Um, yes, they were working as frantically as they could, I mean, but there would not be external pressure to external deadline to consolidate this. I mean, from a, from a purely acquisition perspective, um, I mean, standardization is important. I mean, I would, I mean, Cisco, for example, have, I mean, in monetary terms, uh, uh, stipulated the technological debt after an acquisition. Say so we're buying this company, we're ending up with this, this I mean, um, uh, decentralized heterogeneous landscape, and we put a price tag to it, knowing that we need to invest this much to get us back to a functional state. Daniska said that we became fundamental, the standardization fundamentalist. To move to the sort of a, a solid centralized state. Uh, as soon as possible, no matter what. And I got a mandate from the business organization to do it. They needed two lawyers to independently sign that this was a legal requirement in the business or in the country they were doing to allow any ex exceptions from the standardized way of doing things. And, uh, and I, I mean, I think, so that, that's the journey. Don't, don't, don't promise to consolidate on, on day one because you won't, right? You mean you're setting up yourself for, for failure. Um, but starting starting the journey to to standardize and and move to get it, and of course it's an issue if you can't because of business reasons. Um, then you're probably going to realize that IT is is not where you're going to create the most synergies. And if the if if it's really important for the the business creation, um, for the business value creation, you're going to have an issue. Um, this is certainly going to be one of the most tricky challenges. I I encountered to make this work mm. because I mean you're gonna create this massive spaghetti um, infrastructure yeah. with a lot of dependencies because synergies I mean requires 
connections. That's renewal. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, yeah, well, you don't want to do renewal. You really have to be something, I mean, really, really fundamentally unique for you to motivate yourself doing a renewal. Okay. Um, uh, but that wouldn't be the case. Uh, I would be nervous. <laughs> so so the advice is panic, yeah, okay. panic and run. <laughs> So uh, we have a few minutes left, and I think we have uh, one more question we can ask. Um, can you expand a bit on buying versus building skills, mm. especially when it comes to confidentiality during due diligence? Yes. So um, the building versus buying skills. Um, I mean, it, it comes from a study we did on, on, on actually four different companies and how to use consultants. Um, um, and we learned, I mean, about I mean, the, the possibilities to, to, to source, because I mean, there is a very compelling idea that, okay, so if, if a consultant has been involved in 100 acquisitions, um, why shouldn't we use them rather than our own staff who is I mean, pretty ignorant to these issues? Okay. Um, and yes, it's right. You should, you of course, use them. Um, they should provide you with some, some sort of advice on, on what things, I mean, what areas are important to look for in a, in a due diligence, for example. Um, like very generically, um, but giving a consultant the task of, of doing the due diligence um, that uh, that goes beyond my my belief, um, because I, I mean yes, it's very specific consultant might I mean, work almost I mean know your company just as good as you know, but I mean getting someone from outside that doesn't know I mean the specificness of how your people will react, um, they, like how they will take a, a message. Um, how they will take on a challenge of working overtime in the weekends. Uh, I mean, how they will, how your I mean, communication channels will hold up to a, um, the risk of, of uh, breaking deadlines. I mean, will people be openly um, uh, adamant that they're not going to hit the deadline and, and, help and ask for help? I mean, all those nuances that are typically critical. Uh, so what, what SIP, for example, is doing, that they always have the guy who sits in the due diligence um, it gets responsibility to create integration. So if you if you make make the assessment, make the business case, it's up to you to become the integration manager. So circle the people, so that when you've done and become an integration manager, you become the one who makes the assessment in the next one. Um, they have a quite open route there, um, uh, and it's a uh, what do they have? Like five six people having this role. So it's a reasonably close group, and it builds trying to build this tacit knowledge. And, um, and and you, you do it in parallel the first couple of times you, 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 you've been involved in this role to help out. Um, um, but yeah, of course, it, it is an issue. 